transformed. I'm so proud of him. Brilliant. He's transformed. And, and he does a wonderful video and he says, what I want doctors to know, what I want people to know is even though I'm over 70, I've been able to uh, put my diabetes into remission. He's come off his drugs for everything. So his blood pressure is normal. His blood sugar is normal, but far more important if you can see how smart he is and his wife is proud of him, he's living life. We've got various videos and documents at Health Results about reversing type of diabetes, but I've asked uh, Dr. David Unwin, who was the founding doctor of the Norwood Avenue Protocol, uh, to explain to me how he would explain it to my father, who has got uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, how to change it. Great to have you with us again. Great, thank you. Thanks so for much. all the pioneering, you. pioneering work you've done over the years. So welcome. I'm also going to, I'd like you to understand what we've done at Norwood Avenue. So it's about how would your dad understand type 2 diabetes and how would what we've done at Norwood Avenue be relevant? Okay. So the Norwood Avenue surgery, it's just, uh, just north of Liverpool. We've got nine and a half thousand patients and I've looked after them since 1986. So it's a very long time. So and I think what makes it so special, isn't it, yeah. that uh, the, the area, first of all, you've been there the whole time, and it's an area where it's not changing, you know, people don't en masse leave and yeah. come back. It's a quite, not static's the wrong word, but it's the same patients. Yeah, it's a privilege because I know them and they know me, and it's enabled me to do something that's growing and growing and growing around type 2 diabetes. So let's start with the patient. Okay. I love this guy, this is, uh, this is Chris. He um, unfortunately has poorly controlled type 2 diabetes. He weighs about 20 stone. I've got him on uh, medication for his blood pressure, for type 2 diabetes, for his cholesterol. Okay. And I think my point is, poor Chris, really does he have good health? I don't think it matters how many drugs I give him. He's not really enjoying life. Life is a struggle. Uh, for Chris. What's the relevance of the X8? Well, the point is, you know, when I started at Norwood Avenue in 1986 as a young man, um, people like Chris were very rare. They were very rare. We knew in the whole practice we had 57 people with type 2 diabetes. We've now got 470. And this is what's happening throughout the country, throughout the world. So we have an eightfold increase in the number of people like Chris. Uh, experiencing poor health. Uh, I think it's very important uh, to give these people hope, people like your dad, um, and understanding as to how they could live life without the medication and live a healthy life. And that's what I want to demonstrate with, uh, with, with Chris. And if we just fast forward here, this is Chris now. Wow. So in this, in this photo, bless him, uh, he's about 40. Yeah. In this photo, he's over 60. Oh and his diabetes is in remission, so he has normal blood glucose. He's not on drugs for type 2 diabetes. He's not on drugs for his blood pressure or his lipids. So this is a guy... So you in, find when you start fixing one thing, you start to fix a myriad yes, of things? Yes, th this is what I think I'd like to explain, is how does it come together? Yeah. Uh, so it's very important. Number one, it's possible. So people like Chris give hope, because he would say, if he was here, he'd say, well, if I, I'm an ordinary bloke, I can do it your viewers uh, can do this as well. And the point is, he was one of my very early ones. And the, uh, the relevance of the multiple 94 is at the point when I designed this slide, I actually had 94 people who I'd done exactly the same for Chris, only now there's 98 people. And I know you're interested in yep. there being rather more than 98 people. Well, we're hoping to get to a million over three years. Wow, well, so. that would be wonderful. But only based on the foundation of what you know, yeah, well, a lot I've of learning has come from studying what you've done. It and has, and I've learned a lot from people like Chris, and we're all the time looking at what we can improve and what works. And I think there are two aspects. Uh, one of the things that works is giving people hope, and that's why they, the hope is there. And then the other aspect is understanding the physiology of diabetes, why are you ill yeah. and what's caused it. So, Is there any limits to hope? So my dad's 81, is there any limits? Is it only up to the know, age of I, 50 or 60? No, or? I, love, I love the idea of hope. So the oldest person I've got is 93 years old. Where you've uh, reversed the diabetes. Yes, yes, wow. she's now 93. She was 91 when yeah. I did it. 
and I rang her last week and her son said, I'm so sorry, she's in the garden. I'll have to go and get her. But that's the kind of quality she's living in her own home. Brilliant. And so I, I really don't believe in the idea of you are an age. Yeah. Uh, that's so counterproductive. I, I didn't realise older people were as resourceful, resilient yeah. and capable. So there's hope for your, there's hope for your dad. So onward. So I, I'm hoping that you and the viewers will be able to understand insulin because insulin is key uh, to liver function, to triglyceride levels, to a big belly, to being hungry and having type 2 diabetes. So you may not understand it now, but the process that I go through with my patients we're going to replicate now and hopefully you'll, um, you'll get it. So insulin is a hormone and it's produced by the pancreas gland. It has a vital job to do. Your body knows that a high blood sugar is dangerous. Sees it as poison. Yes, that's right, because glucose over time is actually damaging the lining of your arteries. So a high glucose level is damaging your large arteries, which can lead to strokes and heart attacks, and it can damage the small circulation, which is your eyes and your kidneys. And this is how diabetes does its harm. It's a function of a high blood sugar over time. And the problem uh, lies with, with insulin, as I'm going to explain. But insulin has a job to do. It's got to get sugar out of your bloodstream. So if you eat biscuits or cakes or, or whatever, the blood sugar rises. Insulin's job is rapidly to keep you well, get rid of that sugar. So the big question is, where does the sugar go? Where does the sugar go? And the sugar goes into three main places. Certainly it goes to your muscles for energy. So if you're fit and active, you're running around. But what if you eat more biscuits than you need to run around? Mm -hmm. Where does that extra sugar go? Firstly, uh, insulin is pushing that sugar into the cells of your liver. Okay. And actually the liver is turning that sugar into fat. And that is how um, many, many people with uh, diabetes also have a thing called fatty liver. And actually now we've got to a point where a quarter of the whole of the adult population of the UK and Europe have fatty liver. Wow. A quarter of everybody you know wow. has a fatty liver. And as you're going to learn, that's important in actually how you develop type 2 diabetes. Now the other place that insulin is pushing sugar is into your belly fat. Mm -hmm. And this is how I, when I was 55, was developing a middle-aged spread because I was eating, in my case it was biscuits, more of them than I needed to run around, my liver was filling with fat and my belly began to grow. I thought it was just age. I thought that was normal mm -hmm. um, and I now know it isn't normal and it's nothing, it, it, it doesn't have to be because of age. Now the other place that um, the sugar goes is into the pancreas gland. So the very place that exactly insulin is being so. produced. Yes, yep. so the pancreas gland is where the insulin came from, but unfortunately the fat starts off filling up the liver and then, as I'm going to show in, uh, in the next slide, it is beginning to fill the pancreas gland. So we can see insulin, it's got this vital job to do, get that glucose down urgently, turn it into fat, get rid of it. That's why I've heard you say in the past that insulin is the fat storing hormone. It is the fat, it, or it's fat fertilizer. Some people think of insulin yeah. as fat fertilizer. Yeah. And I know clinically that I'm sometimes forced to give people insulin for type 2 diabetes, which if they need it, they're going to have it. But it tends to make them very heavy because it's driving that extra sugar into central fat. Mm -hmm. And I think the other point that's important is that fat on your thighs or on your arms is one thing, but fat on your belly, central obesity, is metabolically more damaging mm -hmm. um, and linked to eight different forms of cancer and other things on top of When somebody of says that. your visceral fat, is that what we're talking it's about? It's the belly, the belly fat. fat. So yep. it's the fat patch around the organs yep. in your belly. Okay. Uh, it's the middle-aged spread, and insulin is really, really involved in that. So here we are. This is, we're going to show it differently now. I'm a great fan of Roy Taylor at Newcastle, Professor Roy Taylor, and he did the counterpoint study where they were scanning 
people's liver and pancreas over time to see what happened. And what actually happened was as they continued to take in more sugar than they needed for exercise, their liver, just as I explained before, Steve, their liver is filling up with fat. And then what they discovered was that a liver full of fat, unfortunately, interferes with the action of insulin itself. Mm -hmm. So that you become, insulin is less effective. Insulin doesn't do its job of getting rid of that sugar as well. And it's called insulin resistance because you're resistant to the work of insulin. And that okay. is the beginning of type two diabetes. And uh, there's a wonderful um, phrase from Roy Taylor, and he says there's a long, silent scream from the liver of about 10 years, this process of fat building up in the liver. And I know with my patients, when I do the liver function tests, they're abnormal in so many of my patients. And I do the ultrasound, and the ultrasound is showing the fat there. So, so many people know the fat is there, but they don't know what to do about it. And there is, back to your slide earlier on, there's hope, because changing oh, this, your there lifestyle, is. your yes, diet, but, your nutrition can think, happen quite quickly? Yes, it can. So I find um, in the early days I was monitoring everything, um, looking at what happens by cutting the sugar, what happens to my patients, what actually happens, the liver function can improve dramatically by up to about 50% wow. in three to four weeks. Wow. So this bit is clearly uh, reversible. But what Roy Taylor showed was that the next bit is potentially reversible as well. So as you continue to eat those biscuits, your pancreas is now filling with fat and that's interfering with the production of the insulin that you need. So now you, you're, you're in a more a serious diabetic state because the insulin isn't working as well but now you're struggling to even produce the insulin and these sometimes are the kinds of people who need extra insulin because the system just is giving up like my dad they cut, you know yes. they didn't realize yeah. on his own yeah. weight and it's gone on years for years and, and years and 78 the body, when he was yeah, diagnosed the, the body's done its best yeah uh, and it's packed away as much of that sugar as it yeah. can and in a way you can think the fatness is a, is is a defense yeah. Because it's a way to harmlessly store that sugar so it doesn't damage your arteries. So it's got to put it somewhere. Yeah, so yeah. it's got to put it. And then its yeah. ability to pack it away begins to fail. And that's when you start getting the problems with the arteries and uh, so on. But yes, uh, we're always thinking about hope. Uh, but before we go on to that, there's another thing I really want you to understand. And that is, I like to think of all of us as a dual fuel engine. Mm -hmm. So most of the cells in your body could burn two different fuels. You can burn fat or you can burn sugar. And I think we all know fat is a good fuel. But here's an interesting question. Why is somebody that weighs 20 stone like Chris at the beginning, when he's got months of supplies of energy, why is he hungry? Yes. So if you're, if fat's, is a if fuel, it's a perfectly good fuel, and, you and he's got loads of reserves, your own body yeah, fat. Why, doesn't, why doesn't something go switch off? You yep. don't need any more fuel. And you can stop eating, Chris, because yeah, yeah. you've got loads of energy. And if you think about in nature, you don't see grossly fat lions, no. or it doesn't. And that's because there is usually an off switch. Yes. But what is happening is insulin, because of its imperative to deal with sugar, because sugar is dangerous, Insulin has another important trick. It shuts off your ability to burn fat. So if you continue to eat biscuits through the day, there is sugar into the system. So insulin has to get rid of that sugar. So it shuts off your ability to burn fat. So instead of burning your belly fat for energy, yep. you're hungry. So I've got loads of fat here. Each pound of body fat is three and a half thousand calories. Absolutely, it it's could a day. Be, It could be used as energy. <laughs> yes. But the body's really clever. It goes, if I start using that as energy while you're still eating, Absolutely. and you're eating sugar, yeah. which is dangerous, I've got to prioritize getting rid of the dangerous sugar yes. before I even think about yeah. burning body fat. This, we are so well adapted, and it's all about help. Nature actually is working with us, but nature had not anticipated a diet you know, in, in caveman was not eating biscuits all day long. Yeah. So it, this, uh, this setup work was perfectly designed for about 3,000 years ago. And now this helps explain why people are hungry all the time, despite being heavy, why they struggle with diets, despite being heavy, why they have failed so many times with diets. 
because with pure willpower you've stopped eating, but you're still having little snacks through the day. And then sooner or later it all comes back. And I had not understood this until I was 55 years old. I hadn't a thought in my head as that I just thought people were annoying because they wouldn't take my advice. <laughs> and I blamed the patients for not taking my advice. And now I realize my advice was poor and I'm to blame. And now this is better advice. So insulin, we are a hybrid engine. You can be a fat burner. Many of my patients love being fat burners because it's the best way to get rid of your belly and at the same time improve your health. So this is it, we're a hybrid um, engine. If you could reduce sugar substantially, if you can reduce snacking particularly, you're more likely to burn the fat. So this is it. This is, um, we're looking here about how would you reverse type two diabetes? I actually prefer the word remission. There's a lot of discussion about, is it remission? Mm -hmm. Is it reversing? I like remission because it's a reminder that if you uh, go back to eating biscuits, well, you're, it will come back. Yeah. So it's remission in your control. Yeah. There are other people who'd say it, uh, we, we are actually reversing it because it's an improvement and that's, uh, yeah. that is true. I think the important thing is to say there are different ways to do this. So you can see here, if you reduce carbohydrate intake, then many of the things I just explained to you, the sugar turned into fat in the liver and the pancreas would go into reverse. But there are different ways to reduce your carbohydrate. So bariatric surgery, I have patients have bariatric surgery. It's very a serious commitment. It's like a gastric band. Yes, yeah, it yeah, works. Yeah. It does work and it can work very rapidly. But there is a real downside and uh, you know, there is a mortality to that as a procedure, but it works. The other thing is we, you hear about the shakes, the very low calorie diets and the shakes. Well, they, they work as well because you're reducing the carbohydrate intake. Or uh, as we do at Nord Avenue and we have for nine years now, we're giving patients the option of a lower carb diet. And so uh, you, in our case, we're reducing the carbohydrates there. You're reducing the circulating insulin so that you've reduced liver fat. Therefore, the insulin resistance improves. That's half of the battle. The yeah. other half is you're reducing the fat in the pancreas. Mm -hmm. you then uh, there's better secretion of the insulin itself that comes from the pancreas gland. And that's the other half. And so together, it makes a pretty reliable uh, recipe for, in my I would call it, remission of diabetes. So at Norwood Avenue now, 50% uh, of all the people who say I'll give low carb a try are getting remission, by which wow. I mean, it's a great, isn't it? I'm so yeah, proud. Yeah, one and in two people. Yeah, who try it yeah. are going to achieve normal blood sugars off medication. And I, I think a really good point is what happens to the other half. Yeah, I was going to confirm you asked. <laughs> I was about to ask that, but let's just say that this is the, yeah. this is, if we call it a disease uh, or chronic illness that only a few years back, and in fact, still, some doctors still say, is chronic, irreversible, yeah. and progressive. And that's exactly so, you know, when I look at Chris at the beginning, my model is to, I would have been explaining to Chris, I'm so sorry, you have this chronic illness now that we can expect it to worsen as you get older. Uh, but don't worry, you know, I've got drugs I can give you and we m do be prepared now because if you run into problems, I may have to add in other drugs. And I'd also be saying, because diabetes is serious, we need to monitor your eyes and your kidneys. Such a depressing message, yeah, no hope yeah, there at no all. Hope, yeah. Now what I'm saying is give me a chance. I think it's unlikely I'm going to need drugs. You have a 50% chance of achieving remission. and just to come back to the others. Even if I don't achieve remission, I am seeing really significant improvements in diabetic control, improvements in blood pressure, improvements in weight. Um, and, and that's energy. the reversal. So remission means I can get you off the drugs, you don't yeah. need the drugs, you're in remission. Reversal means probably less drugs mm. and other measurements getting better, like your, yeah. so your waistline, line, your the ones blood I pressure. Don't get, absolutely, the ones I don't get into remission, it's still really worthwhile because I'm likely to use less drugs and they're just healthier. Yeah. And that for me, it's all about what's your life like? And yeah. can we, what's the potential of this human being in sure. front of me? 
So moving on. So this is the, the reversal. This is my latest model, really, of okay. diabetes. And given what we said before, that we're wanting to control your blood sugar. So we don't want it to go high. So if we see the barrel here, yep. we've got sugar or glucose is the yep. particular sugar we're worried about. We've got glucose going in and glucose coming out. Yep. And the balance of those two, as you can understand, is the level of fluid in the barrel. Yep. And you're wanting it lowish. So there's pretty clearly um, two things we have to look at. What are the sources mm -hmm. of the sugar that we're worried about. You've only glucose. got one sugar this side, you've also got rice, rice potato, that's well, not sugar is it? That is sugar and that is because starch, the molecule, the, uh, the starch molecule, I'm going to show you that yep. molecule shortly, is glucose molecules holding hands. Okay. So that with digestion, rice becomes a surprising amount of sugar, potatoes, breakfast cereals. It's nature's way of storing and concentrating sugar in grains, in potatoes. So it isn't just about sugar. So you've got sugar going in, then you've got sugar coming out. Now exercise, yes, exercise is great for people with uh, type two diabetes because um, it not only uses up the, uh, the glucose, but it improves your sensitivity to insulin. So that's exercise yeah. is a win-win. Yeah. Of course, on the whole, up until I started this, I was using drugs. Yep. So yes, we use insulin, and as you've already heard, insulin gets rid of that glucose yep. by putting it into your belly. What are these two words here? These are other drugs that okay. people often use. So the SGL2 inhibitors are amazing new drugs. They actually cause you to wee out sugar mm -hmm. in so, the urine. So, so with, the, with the exception of exercise and taking drugs, there's no really other way of, other than turning the tap off. You've got to exercise more. Yeah. Or take drugs or turn the tap off. Yes, that's right. it. And in fact, that's what I come to now. Yeah. Is that I, I missed this bit. And it just so, just turn the tap off. Just to, I say to patients, it's so obvious. Sugar in, sugar out. I can help you with the sugar out. The exercise will help the dregs. But why? It's just not logical to keep eating Cheerios. And yep. It's just madness. So the, so the first thing before I turn the tap off is realise what is sugar. Then. Absolutely. You so have if you don't to know. know rice turns into sugar, which I know you've done a load of yeah, research, yeah, yeah. which hopefully we'll come on to in a bit, your spoonful of sugars, you need to learn what turns into sugar inside the body so you can turn the tap off. Absolutely. And yeah. I'll be honest that um, I, I, I think I used to talk about sugar, but I had completely missed starchy carbohydrates as a significant source of sugar. Yep. And I remember there was one patient who asked me if I'd got O-level biology, <laughs> because she, she said, it's just so obvious and you never mentioned this. Yep. Why did you not mention And I'm so ashamed. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think I, I didn't realize how important lifestyle was and the difference diet could make. And I put my faith into drugs and I was turning to drugs and ignoring my patients and what they were capable of. And what's new now, I know what people are capable of, and we do it time after time, week after week. So here we are. I have a kind of model, really, that if you have type 2 diabetes, you could see glucose as a sort of metabolic poison because mm -hmm. you struggle to burn and deal with glucose. Yes. So um, it's immediately obvious that you should be avoiding sugar. And just a point of explanation, many, many patients have a, uh, a blood test called the haemoglobin A1c. And the haemoglobin A1c, brilliant blood test, gives me a good idea of how sugary your blood has been in the preceding three months. So this is how we diagnose type 2 diabetes. A high haemoglobin A1c means the blood's been very sugary, your insulin isn't working properly, and depending on how high, we're telling you you've got either diabetes or pre-diabetes. And, and for the layman, the three to four months is really interesting. That's how long a red blood cell lives inside Absolutely. the body. The sugar attaches to it. So looking at the blood in the sugar or your HbA1c, it tells you almost like a, a, a file in a case of what's happened in that, yes. that period. It's, it's so genius. So it's, it's for every blood cell on the day that red blood cell is born, the sugary environment, depending on how sugary that environment was, an amount of the sugar attaches irreversibly because this is what sugar does. It can latch irreversibly onto proteins, hence the damage in the arteries. So the red blood cell, each one when it's born, 
has a, has a, a, a sort of a scale of how sugary you were on that day. Okay. And when you look averagely at all the red blood cells, you've got an average. And this is a great blood test because it means I find so many patients give up the biscuits for the three days before the blood test. But that doesn't work because I know how sugary you were a month ago. Yeah. What a, a, a reasonably new test and it's so brilliant, the haemoglobin A1C. So I would say to people, the haemoglobin A1C is a measure of how sugary your diet has been in the preceding few months. And that is because 95% of how sugary you are is what you've eaten. Yeah. Which is like so simple, isn't it? Yeah. So it's what you've eaten and you're not surprised. <laughs> I think we've to be fair and that there are circumstances where you're sugary and you haven't eaten it. Sometimes when you're very ill or very stressed, stress can put up blood sugar and there are medications that doctors can give. So there are people who have poor control of diabetes and it isn't what they've eaten. Things like prednisolone steroids will put up your sugar. But for 95% of yep. us, and, and I would often say Broadly, we've eaten our way into this epidemic of type yeah. 2 diabetes. It's a new epidemic. Yeah. It wasn't there when I was a young doctor, just the 57, now 470. It's a new epidemic and we've eaten our way into this. So the first priority, which is pretty obvious from what I've said already, is that you should cut out table sugar. Yeah. You, that sugar, table sugar. And I, th I think most people know that. Mm -hmm. They know that type 2 diabetes, you shouldn't be having sugar in your tea and your coffee. Some people do, but I think the next question you were... Or on to your cereals, which are yeah. sugar anyway. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Sugar on sugar. <laughs> yeah, I see that all the time, sugar with your sugar. Um, so most people know about um, table sugar, but what they don't realise, which is what we were talking about a little earlier, is the starch molecule. So this, each one of these is a glucose molecule. Mm -hmm. And just as I told you, they're holding hands, they're bonded together, to make a giant molecule, the starch molecule. Digestion, the um, enzymes in digestion, break these links and you end up with immense amounts of glucose floating about. So you've eaten your cornflakes, your potatoes, yep. your rice, and it's rapidly broken down into surprising amounts. And this is what I confessed to you when I was obese for, for 20 years, 25 years I was yeah. obese. I'd have a baked potato most nights because I, I thought it was a vegetable and it was yeah. doing me good. And I think what's even worse <laughs> is I was recommending that sort of thing to patients because I would have thought a baked potato is virtuous and better food. And then you'd be mystified. Why am I still fat? Yeah. Why am I sleepy and tired? Yeah. And I, and I would probably think you're lying. And I think that's the other, th the terrible <laughs> thing was, so you would have been my patient. Yeah. And I, I, you would have said, well, I'm having a baked potato. Yeah. And I bet you would have had it with tuna or whatever that well, is. Probably even worse because I was having it with beans because there's another vegetable, but the beans in a yeah, can yeah. Covered, and I, covered in sugar. Yeah, so. and I would have thought <laughs> the beans were. But the, the terrible thing is that you would have remained heavy. Yeah. And then I'm disappointed. And I think, yeah, but I bet he's cramming something else. And th this was the terrible thing for me because patients were actually taking my advice and they were and you'll see an example soon of a healthy breakfast that I was advising and I had missed this vital thing that starchy carbs particularly refined starchy carbs like bread cereals so on break down into a lot of sugar and that's what we come into now so there's a bit of interesting history at Norwood Avenue behind this so this is this is my uh, my way of explaining how sugary are foods, uh, what, what are the consequences of eating different foods to people with type 2 diabetes. Yeah, and I'm going to stop you just there. This yeah. is, as far as I'm concerned, I've only been in this space four or five years, this is a game changer, a step changer that virtually every expert I speak to refers to Dr. David Unwin from the Norwood Avenue Protocol has come up with a way of visualising what's happening when we consume certain yeah. foods. Yeah, so the, the problem, it begins with the glycemic index. So the glycemic index ranks different carbohydrates against pure, pure glucose. And from it, you get another complicated thing, which you don't need to remember, called the glycemic load. And that gives you an idea of for a portion of food, like 150 grams of basmati rice, it'll say, well, what's the effect on blood glucose in terms of grams of glucose? But what I discovered from these two things with my own patients, people like Chris, that 
I was telling him about grams and he didn't understand grams. Yeah. And also he didn't really understand glucose because glucose wasn't a sugar he cooked with or he yeah. was familiar with. So I got together with an expert on the glycemic index, Dr. Jeffrey Leavesey, and together we redid the maths for 800 different foods and reinterpreted the results in terms of teaspoons of sugar, something you are familiar with. Yeah. So if we look now at 150 grams of boiled basmati rice. Which is slightly smaller than that portion I get in the Chinese tin. Yes, it is, yeah. absolutely. It's a smallish bowl. Yeah. So 150 grams of boiled basmati rice yeah. can be expected to affect your blood sugar to approximately the same extent as 10 teaspoons of sugar. And a teaspoon is around four grams. Each teaspoon is four grams. So, there's so a while the death diabetic might go, crikey, I'm cutting out the sugar in my coffee, which I used to have two <laughs> spoons, yeah. a smallish portion is like having five coffees in a row all with together. two teaspoons. And, and the important thing is all together. Yeah. And you would totally have not have factor True. that in yeah. and also so you may have had rice at lunchtime but if, if you go on and then have potato at tea time which you might so easily have done similarly again a small portion of boiled potato which you wouldn't have thought of was that bad for you yeah a bit like your baked because actually yeah, yeah. whether it's baked potato or boiled potato much the same yeah that's nine teaspoons of sugar so in that day, you could have had 10 teaspoons mm -hmm. with your lunch, with a, a takeaway curry, and then uh, you've gone home and thought, I'll do something virtuous now, I'll have the baked potato. That would be nine, and probably it was a big baked potato, so maybe it's 15, so you've taken to 25 teaspoons of sugar. So it's really no surprise when you look at that, and you add in things like a banana, is yeah. that's a ripe banana, but it's nearly six teaspoons of sugar, wow. or a single slice of wholemeal bread, so I would have been saying that was so healthy. Yeah. A single slice of wholemeal bread Still. is approximately three teaspoons. So you can see that the whole nation yeah. so easily yeah. is into 50 teaspoons. Yeah. And when you see it like that, it's not really a surprise that your yeah. liver is turning to fat. It's like the... I told you about my dad. He goes to Subway and he has that, that 12 inch, whatever it is. And he went, oh, since I've been diabetic, I'll make sure the filling's really good. So the filling's irrelevant, Dad. Yeah, we worked it out. It was the bread and the gram weight, without even the butter, the bread alone in that 12 inch, same as 15 teaspoons of sugar. Exactly. So and diabetic he, thinks he's doing right because yeah, he's putting he, in the egg that's and he's right. putting I in. don't know how old your dad is, yeah. but he, he'd have no idea yeah. that, and, and he would struggle, struggle to be told that yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. It is quite difficult. I think the good news on here yeah. is there are, there are lots of foods delicious foods that don't put up your blood sugar. Yeah. So for somebody with type 2 diabetes, it makes such sense that things like meat, chicken, fish, eggs, full fat dairy, particularly green veg, particularly green veg, nuts, things like that, and also some of the fruits, the less sugary ones like raspberries, they're the basis of the low carbohydrate diet because yeah. I know that if you monitor blood sugar and you've just eaten steak and broccoli, your blood sugar will hardly shift at all. And that's the very basis of the low carb diet that we've used now. And we are, it's nine years at Norwood Avenue. And what we're interested in is how can you produce a tasty meal? Yeah. It um, is that shift to learning, isn't it? Oh, we yeah. used to have a guilty pleasure in our family and we only ever did it Christmas because it's so bad for you. Mm. But we'd make that homemade pate with loads of butter and the yeah. offal can't be good because that's the cheap meat. Yeah. And it's loads of butter which can't be good for you. And we used to eat it guiltily. Uh, is that the right word? Guilty, yeah, you know, yeah. with guilt. And now, yeah. of course, we learned that was the healthy bit of the entire meal because yeah. the butter nor the offal, the chicken livers, put up your glucose no, level. Particularly for somebody with type 2 diabetes yeah. where things like protein and fat become uh, safer. So this is just illustrating the very average breakfast that, as a doctor, I would have been recommending back in 2012. So bran flakes with milk, but I would say no sugar on there a slice of brown uh, uh, toast and I think people often forget about fruit juice and if you see here this is a small glass of fruit juice equivalent to 8.6 yeah. teaspoons of sugar wow. so that as a breakfast yeah which I would have thought was healthy it's about 16, 16. Teaspoons, it's about yeah. 16 whereas you could have you could have a three egg omelet with cheese and coffee with cream if you want and then that breakfast is probably under a teaspoon. <laughs> and that gives you, that's so amazing. You could still have an enjoyable meal and you haven't ruined your, yeah. your blood glucose. Nobody needs to read this. It's just a low carb 
diet that we use. One of the things I would, one of the tricks is turn the, turn the white stuff green. Yeah. So that you would leave the protein, have your steak, have your chops, have your whatever. But why instead of the white stuff, why don't you have loads of green or two lots of green? Yeah. Um, and it, it, enjoy your curry, but don't have that rice. Have it on uh, broccoli or zucchini, something else. Yeah, yeah. Or think of a stir fry. And that's why we've got hundreds of recipes on, on the app, because at the end of the day, there are certainly things you want to avoid or really minimise if you're yes. diabetic. But, the, and, but it doesn't have to be restrictive because there are so many things you can enjoy. And the things that you can enjoy are probably things you've given up for years thinking yes. they were bad for you, like the bacon. Yes. And yet, really, they don't have effect on, 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 your, on your insulin or yes. your diabetes. Yeah. I mean, it was true before. You shouldn't be having fat and sugar. That's true. That combination is just going to end up enormous. Um, but I suppose the advice before, we didn't think so much about the sugar and we majored on the fat. And then people were still becoming diabetic in my practice. As I say, even though I spent all those years saying, watch the fats, it didn't stop the eightfold increase in yeah. diabetic problems with one practice. But we're earlier on we're saying fat's okay. What you're saying is fat's okay, but not if you're having sugar. If you're having yeah. sugar and fat together, it's That's a right. Don't recipe have a, that, for disaster. That, that, it is. Yeah. It is. If you have fat and sugar together, then it everything, all the problems are even worse because the fat, of course, is still a lot of calories yeah. and you're not burning it yes. because of the insulin. So the, the sugar will make you fat and the fat will add to that and you're hungry. So it's the worst of all possible worlds. But that's the world that many of my patients were in. Let's just clear this up because it's so important. If I have cheese on its own, it's OK because it, it's more fat. But if I put cheese on the biscuits, because of the carbs, yes, the body's then got to deal with the, yes. in, the, the insulin's got to deal with the sugar. Yes. And while it's do, doing that, it can't deal with the fat. I'm yeah. just going to get fat. You can't fatter. burn the fat. So that then, you're right, the biscuit, the sugar in the fat means your insulin's high. Yeah. So the, the sugar from your biscuit yeah. means that instead of being able to burn the fat in the yeah. cheese, that's going to be laid down. Yeah. But and put then, that cheese on a celery stick, different it's story. It's much uh, much better yeah. and also it's not just that but the biscuit as I used to find tends to leave me hungry so I go back for and I'm back in and out of that fridge yeah. all night long yeah. having uh, more and more so we're nearly at the end I just want you to meet one more okay. patient I'm so fond of this guy this is this is Roy and this was just as he presented to me a couple of years ago and um, he, he came in and I had the news you've got type 2 diabetes. He was over 70. You've got uh, type 2 diabetes. And he also had high blood pressure already. He was already on medication for that. He wasn't too surprised because he felt really, he didn't feel well. He was sleepy. Life was a struggle. And I, I think if you see now, mm -hmm. he's transformed. I'm so proud of him. Brilliant. He's transformed. And, and he does a wonderful video and he says, what I want doctors to know, what I want people to know is even though I'm over 70, I've been able to uh, put my diabetes into remission. He's come off his drugs for everything. So his blood pressure is normal. His blood sugar is normal. But far more important, if you can see how smart he is and his wife is proud of him, he's living life. And um, he, I think the important thing, and I mention it there, um, you can improve uh, weight, blood pressure, lipid profile, liver function. But the best thing is sell people's self-esteem. Yeah, sure. Because Roy now, he doesn't need me. Yeah. Uh, he's just a, he's a person, he's a well person. He's not a patient anymore. And he's, that, no wonder he's proud. But it's a win-win situation because he doesn't need me, so I've got more spare time. Yeah. Also, if I do see him, it's such fun because I'm just hearing, you know, he's joined a gym, he's done this, Brilliant. he's started new hobbies. So I, this whole thing, you know, low carb, at Norwood Avenue, it's changed the doctors' lives in terms of the hope that we've had and the self-esteem I've uh, developed and the patients. A lot of it's been collaborative so that I learn from people like Roy and so much from Chris and all of the other hundreds uh, we've done now. It's fun yeah, uh, and it works and it works more than once. If I can summarise some of those then, uh, diabetes type 2. Type 2, that's really important. Type 2 is about insulin resistance, which is caused by having too much insulin in the cells, not 
taking yeah. as much notice. Yeah. That's caused by too much sugar in the bloodstream. That yeah. co that's caused by sugar we know of, table sugar and so on, but also those hidden sugars in certain carbohydrates, yes. especially the processed carbohydrates. And therefore the simple thing to get, not well, simple to understand, once you understand it may be more difficult to implement sometimes until you see those gorgeous recipes, yeah. um, is you just cut down those carbohydrates and certainly those processed ones, and then bit by bit, day by day, step by step, read more, understand more, learn more yeah. about where all those sugars are hidden, till you really push it down so that then you put it, in your words, remission, our words, re, you know, reversing, ultimately re remission, I guess. Um, and you've had somebody that's 83 that's done it, so it's for everybody. I think so. I mean, just to say, if you were on a lot of prescribed medication, so if you were, you would have to do this with a healthcare professional sure. because they know this is sort of useful information. But again, at Norwood Avenue, yes, the oldest has been yeah. Um, 93. Nice I think well. the, the, another point just to add is the idea that it is a journey. Yeah. So that for Chris, who you saw at the beginning, he started so early. Yeah. And he's had ups and downs over the years and he's yeah. needed support and, he, and there's been carb creep where he's gone back to the carbs and the biscuits. Yeah. But the important and thing that's a journey is, that happens to quite a lot of us. I've put yeah, a bit of weight on as a know, we, lockdown with yeah, a bit of carb creep, yes. and I don't even know what that's I should what be doing. That's what we call yeah. it, carb creep. Yeah. It's just so common. Yeah. And I, I think the thing is that if your blood sugar control, yeah. if your hemoglobin A1C starts to climb, the first question is what it should have been right at the beginning. I wonder where that sugar's come from. Yeah. So rather than maybe medicate from as a yeah. doctor, rather than me medicating you, yeah. I should be saying to you, Steve. You seem a bit sugary. Do you know where that's come from? Yeah. And so often you actually do. Well, yes, quite often you do, and that's why we recommend lots of people have glucose monitors measured before and after a meal. But my dad asked me the question the other day that I couldn't answer, and that is why when he wakes up in the morning when he hasn't eaten for a while and he does it because yeah. he has to test himself every day because he's got, got it quite severely, why is his glucose high in the morning yet he's just had a, a break from food? Yeah, I'm asked that a lot. It has a name. It's called the Dawn Phenomenon. So the people with type 2 diabetes are surprised because they find when they check their blood sugar in the morning, it's high. And they clearly haven't been scoffing in the night, so what's going on? It's very interesting, this. And what is actually happening is, overnight, you can produce your own sugar. And this is done from the liver. You've got a small store of sugar in the liver in a thing called glycogen. But also, you can produce sugar from protein and fat. Right. So this is why, you know, how much carbohydrate do you need in your, or must you have in the diet? And the answer is none, really, because you can manufacture, not only have your stores, but you can manufacture sugar. Yeah. The thing with somebody with diabetes is because they're insulin resistant, yeah. that sugar that he made overnight didn't get uh, dealt with. Got it. And, and so he wakes up, it's yeah. there. And, it. and I think that for him is, is, so why are we having cereals for breakfast? Yeah. Because he woke up sugary, and yeah. then his response is, I need more, more sugar. sugar. And then, you know, by mid-morning, he's yeah. into double figures on his blood sugar. We call it the carbo coaster. Yeah. You, that, you're always hungry, because... Yeah, and that, that's, yeah. That's, so that's the dawn phenomenon. Yeah. It's very well known. Now, while I've got thinking. you, a few more questions. Yeah. So I'd already written a couple of health books, and I thought, studied everything I need to know about insulin and diabetes. Yeah. But I, until you told me the other day, I want to share with everybody, a healthy adult, and let's bring back up that slide about how much sugars in rice and, and yeah, potatoes. Yeah. A healthy adult, in our, how many pints of blood do we have in the body? Five. In five, five litres. Five, five, li five litres of blood. Five litres of blood. Yes. How many teaspoons of sugar would a healthy adult be suspending in, in that? Yeah. This is something that always amazes me, and the answer is one single teaspoon. It's a tiny amount of sugar. <sighs> so. In a way, you have yeah. one teaspoon in your blood right now. If we yeah. drained you out, it'd yeah. be messy, but we could do it. We could drain you out. If we took out the sugar, there'd be one teaspoon, about five grams, four to five So you have that grams. rice. Yeah. The question is, where does all the rest go? Yeah. And you answered that in the first slide, goes into the liver, yeah. some into the pancreas, where we're actually yeah. creating the insulin, but most of it to the belly. Yeah. So, it, so a small amount of sugar can put up your blood sugar alarmingly if insulin isn't working. And of course, that's revealed in somebody with diabetes because their insulin isn't working. So a small amount of dietary sugar is, you know, this is why yep. a single slice of bread can put your blood sugar up because yep. there isn't much sugar there and you don't need much. 
So we can only, or should only be suspending about one teaspoon of sugar. Yes. So the, and most people know what table sugar is sugar because we call it sugar. There's lots of hidden sugars in all these carbs and so on and so forth. So great resources to look at are your charts where you break it into plain English. Yes. And then the GI stroke GL charts yes. to get a good understanding of the load of glucose from yes. those yeah. portions. And that's the basis of the low GI diet. Yeah. And that, that's a very popular diet. It, 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 is really similar to a low carb diet. So those are other resources. The, the charts, there are actually seven of them. And they've been, uh, I think they're now in 14 different languages. Well done, so that there's not many people can't find out. There are, there are loads of resources. I think it depends how people learn what they want. Well, thank goodness we've got people like you because of course most of the world is now run by just 10 food companies that probably most of them want us to keep eating that sugar and that hidden sugar. Right. So well done for fighting the corner yeah. for us normal people. And uh, all your research, your spoonful of sugar, these stories I think have helped us all in really plain English understand the cause, giving us the hope that it is possible to reverse and yeah. even put it in remission. So thank you very much indeed. You're so welcome, thank you. Cheers, David. Thank you.